Hello, good evening. And welcome everyone to the second annual Wilhelm Wundt Dialogue, Attachment Theory, Past, Present and Future. I'm very happy that so many of you could make it, um, that so many of you could come tonight. Uh, we've all from the organizing committee been looking forward to this event for quite a while. There's many reasons why we look forward to this. One of the reasons is I get to do this. Once a year at the Leipzig Research Center for Early Child Development, we select a dissertation that was defended at Leipzig University in the area of early childhood development and uh, selected for a prize, and I get to hand that prize out today. And I'm very happy to announce that this year it goes out to Hannah Schleyhoff. Thank you very much. For a dissertation with the title, Why Do We Imitate Nonsense? The Underlying Motivations of Over-Imitation. We've, uh, at the LFE a while ago, decided against flowers in uh, favor of toys. Oh, so I hope you, you so enjoy this in your free time. <laughs> The other reason we were so excited about tonight's event was because we knew who the speakers would be. Um, we were able to um, invite and attract to accept that invitation uh, to experts in the field of attachment um, research, and I would like to take a very quick minute to introduce both of them um, to you in case they need an introduction. The first presenter tonight will uh, be Professor Ross Thompson, who's a distinguished professor at the University of California at Davis and the head of the Social and Emotional Development Lab there. In reference to our topic, um, Ross is on editorial wards of uh, several of uh, the journals that publish some of the most important research in this field, and he's contributed to several volumes with the topic of child attachment, early child attachment. Over and above that, over his whole career, he's been committed to improving childhood welfare, child welfare, and that's why um, I thought it was nothing but fitting that this year the American Psychological Association selected him um, for the Yuri Bronfenbrenner Award, uh, for a Life Achievement um, Award for contribution to both science and society in developmental psychology. Ross, thank you so much for coming tonight. The other dialogue partner for tonight is Professor Heidi Keller, who's uh, been an important figure in developmental psychology internationally, but especially in Germany, uh, maybe most prominently associated with her views on the cross-cultural variation in child development and the importance of studying child development from a cross-cultural perspective. In reference to the topic tonight, um, she's published widely on issues of attachment, um, for example, an edited volume even this year called The Cultural Nature of Attachment. She's received the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award um, from the German Psychological Association, um, but has also been contributing in several ways to transfer and uh, um, practical application of her research by contributing to increasing the cultural sensitivity of childhood pedagogy and childhood learning. Welcome, Heidi, to Leipzig. The last person to introduce tonight is the moderator for tonight's dialogue. That's Dr. Lars White from our own Leipzig Research Center for Early Child Development. Um, Lars is, uh, did his PhD in a collaborative project between the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology and the local clinic for child and adolescent psychiatry, and now heads a research group um, on child and adolescent psychiatry at Leipzig University. Lars, I'll hand over to you. So, those are not my slides, <laughs> but maybe I can uh, just use this brief moment to say thank you for the introduction, um, and it um, means I don't need to introduce myself, which is great, but I really look forward to tonight's um, debate, which promises to be a very stimulating debate, I think, um, one between two of the world's leading theorists in this research area. Um, now, my um, job, my task is not just um, to give to moderate this debate, but also um, to 
um, put down the rules. So <laughs> I'm also a referee. So um, I've got a maximum of 10 minutes, so you can check me on that one. And um, then I have, uh, I'll give both of the speakers 20 minutes um, for each presentation, followed by 30 minutes of discussion, which will be moderated by myself, and then we'll open the floor for questions. So I don't see anybody raising any hands. Uh, I think it's clear. So let me kick off um, for you and give you a little bit of background on this topic. That's, that's really the only thing I want to do. Um, I think tonight's debate is um, particularly timely um, because we live in times um, where uh, migration levels are peaking, um, where um, cultures are mingling, perhaps more so than ever before. And I think with this um, in mind, I think we, we really need to start thinking about um, how much we can apply our Western concepts and Western ideas about what caregiving is um, to um, these other contexts. And I think this is really at the heart of today's, tonight's debate. So like I said, I'll give you a bit of background. I want to um, present what is probably more of a, um, a research perspective. Um, so this um, debate has um, been has resurfaced, if you will, this year um, in child development, for example. There have been a spate of articles um, with responses um, by Heidi Keller's group and, um, and so on, and by, by, by the Judy Messman group from, from the Netherlands. Um, there have been other publications in, in, um, in journal, very, very uh, large-scale journals. And, um, and of course, uh, there is the Handbook of Attachment with uh, the chaptered volume, which has just um, been published this year, um, which also contains relevant chapters um, for, for tonight's debate. And as um, Daniel Hahn already mentioned, the chaptered volume by Heidi Keller, um, who, which, which appeared last year. So I think it is, a, it is both academically and, and if you will, po politically and, and, and socially a very important debate. So my, my job, like I said, was, is to give you a little bit of background. Um, and I would like to talk about some of what, what are the key pillars, really, of, of attachment theory. And starting off, I want to talk about what attachment is. So what is, what, how do we define attachment? And um, what, what, what I remember coming across this it, when I was first reading about attachment, thinking, OK, what exactly is an affectional tie? So attachment bond, an affectional, I was thinking, I don't think it's this, but um, I wasn't 100% wasn't certain. But no, what an affectional tie is, it's an emotional connection um, between two people that is persistent across time. Hang on, I already made a mistake there. It's not necessarily between two people, I think, but we'll get into that later. It's emotionally significant. It involves a specific non-interchangeable person to whom you wish to maintain proximity or closeness, if you will. And if this is not possible, so in cases of separation, um, we feel distress. And there is a sixth criterion which is specific for attachment bonds, and that is in times of distress, we seek the security and comfort in the relationship with the person. So I think we all know about the strange situation procedure that's paradigmatic for this um, last point, I think. Now, um, there's many ways to skin this cat. <laughs> and I think one that really has helped me in understanding attachment theory is um, distinguishing between two components, if you will. So um, the, the first component is basically uh, what do we all share in common component, right? So the normative component, if you will. So um, the hypothesis that goes along with that, with that component is, is um, I'll go to that straight away, is what, what some have called the universality hypothesis. So that when a person is given the opportunity, and we're thinking, of course, here primarily of infants, um, when they are given the opportunity, um, they will become attached to one or more specific caregivers. Right? So this is a fundamental postulate of attachment theory. And um, if you have the time to read the chapter by Mesman and colleagues, it's very inspiring. And I think um, what you'll find there is that they say it's, it's very strong support for this particular hypothesis cross-culturally. So that's, that's quite, um, quite remarkable in a way. Um, now, the next hypothesis is the one I think that most of you will be more familiar with. So this is how do we all differ? So the question is, what, in what ways do we differ, right? And this explains deviations from the modal or normative patterns. And here the hypothesis goes, the majority of infants 
are securely attached in contexts that are not inherently threatening to human health or survival. So the idea is there's a basically a, a distribution that I think probably many of you will know as well with the majority of infants being securely attached. And, and uh, let, me, let me just quickly remind you of what that means. What does securely attached mean in um, the strange situation? Um, the strange situation procedure, I think most of you will know, but I'll just repeat, it's a separation or union procedure that also involves a stranger coming into the room and the infant's response to the, to, to the, to the stranger, but also um, to the parent and especially to the parent's reunion are fundamental in, let, in coding the attachment. And what we look for when we code attachment in this situation is the extent to which children show go towards the caregiver in which they, they seek the closeness, they seek they, and they maintain that contact upon reunion. Um, now, of course, there's other patterns, and there's other patterns which are still normative. So when we say that secure attachment is about 60% of the, or 62 or 65%, um, then these are still within the normal population. You still see these other patterns of attachment. Um, so we see the um, anxious ambivalent, um, which is characterized by going on fussing even when the caregiver picks the child up so they don't calm down, even though um, the, the parent is trying to soothe them. Obviously, I'm, I'm really going through this very fast, but it's more complex than that, but I'm just giving you the sort of key points here. And finally, the avoidant type, which um, doesn't seem to care much about whether the caregiver re-enters the room, just Gary is on playing um, and, and doesn't really pay attention much. So you've got these different types, and the, the hypothesis is the secure type is cross-culturally the norm, right? This is one of the fundamental postulates, again, of attachment theory. Um, and finally, um, the, not finally, this is the second to last hypothesis, the sensitivity hypothesis, um, which claims that attached, so this is really, where does all of this come from? So we have these patterns, and where do they originate? And they originate from child rearing antecedents, right? Um, and particularly sensitive responsivity um, of the um, attachment figure. To what extent are they sensitively responsive? Um, and, and of course, there are again other predictors of attachment, but this has been considered one of the key ones, although there is the so-called transmission gap, right? Which I'm sure you'll hear more about tonight. Okay, and the final one, and I think personally, this is really the key hypothesis, um, which unfortunately has received the least cross-cultural support so far, um, and that is the competence hypothesis. So we, of course, believe that a secure attachment is something that the child internalizes, that the child internalizes into an internal working model. So let me play that out for you, what is meant by that. The idea is basically that a child has interactions over time, repeated interactions with the caregiver, learns that these are the normative responses of my caregiver to, for example, distress, to my anxiety. I learn that my caregiver will come and comfort me, for example. Um, and this, over time, will be internalized and will lead to a formation of representation, of internal working models, as we call them, in attachment theory. And that, in turn, influences how I will react to other interactions in the future. So this, I think, is really crucial because it's the reference point. It's why we need to know or why it matters. Yeah? Why should we even care if someone is, is securely, insecurely attached? Only if this holds true should we care. So that's really where I want to leave you. Um, and I don't want to sort of take anything out of the debate, <laughs> go on here. So um, I'll, without further ado, um, hand over to Ross Thompson. And um, I really, really look forward to tonight. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> now, can you all hear me? Yes. OK. Um, I want to thank you for being here. 
Um, when my students show flagging interest in my lectures at the University of California, Davis, I will remind them of hundreds of students who came out on an evening to hear me. Um, and I am appreciative of your interest in this topic and, and of your interest in furthering your knowledge of psychology. We have a baby here, and I just, uh, we've all heard her a few, or him a few moments ago, and I hope that this baby will sound out every so often and remind us of exactly why we're here. Um, I am grateful to be here, I am delighted to be here, um, and I am particularly delighted to, to be at the University of Leipzig and becoming acquainted with this remarkable program uh, focused on early child development um, and uh, to become acquainted with some of the faculty who have made this program so special. And I'm also delighted to be here with, with, um, with Heidi. Uh, whose work I've been admiring for virtually all of my career. She's the first person I turn to when I'm uh, needing to think about uh, infancy and childhood and culture. Uh, and I do recommend the book that she put together, the Schrungman Forum book on the cultural nature of attachment, uh, because if you're really looking for a sense of the state of the art in this field, that is, a, that is the first place I would send you. Um, now, I heard some very kind comments about my long-standing contributions to attachment theory and research. Uh, and you can tell by how I look that I've been in this field for a while. Um, let me tell you how I got here, though. Um, because when I began my career as a graduate student um, and did my first dissertation using the strain situation, the findings of that made me a pariah within the field of attachment theory and research. And if that wasn't enough, I also published a critical review of the attachment research with my dissertation advisor, Michael Lamb, uh, that further solidified our status, uh, at least among those who did attachment research, as the enemies of attachment. Uh, we, were, we were shunned at conferences. Uh, we were excluded from forums. And, and even several decades later, when I spoke at the University of Minnesota's Institute of Child Development, which was really the home of where a lot of this research was done, uh, one of the per persons there who was at the conference where I was speaking remembered those times and remembered that I was, in fact, the enemy of attachment research. So here I am now um, being called out to defend attachment research with that kind of beginning. Um, and I mention that because um, you all are young and it simply shows how much things can change over time, but also how much things can change over time, both as a result of how you grow and develop, but also as a result of how the world around you grows and develops. And that certainly is true with respect to attachment. So I want to begin my comments by making reference to a former colleague of mine named Phil Shaver who uh, was recently retired from the University of California at Davis. Phil is somebody who studies adult attachment. And he used to say, um, and, and said this on several occasions, that attachment theory must be regarded as one of the most successful 20, 20th century theories in psychology, uh, which is a bold claim to make, given the numbers of theories we have, but also the prominence and longevity of many of them. Well, what was the reason for his making this claim? Well, one thing was the longevity of attachment research. Um, this field has, this, this theory has been going on for more than 50 years. Piaget has not had such an enduring influence on the field. Uh, and so it's, it, it's gotta be given some attention for that reason. A second reason though for Phil's claim that attachment theory has to be one of the most influential 20th century theories in psychology is its influence on everyday thinking about parent-child relationships, right? I mean, by contrast with attitudes that existed 60 or 70 years ago, hardly anybody today doubts the importance of parental sensitivity, the significance to young children of the security they derive from close relationships, or the idea that early relationships can have long-term influence on children's development. In fact, when I teach my undergraduates about this stuff, their response is, well, so what? Of course, everybody knows that. Uh, and if they really get, want to know, I, I, I tell them that when I started graduate school, the article that was being read in 1976 in my first year of graduate stu school study was, was an influential psych bulletin article by Masters and Wellman, you can look it up, uh, despairing of even the possibility of researchers being able to study individual differences in the quality of parent-child relationships. That's how much the world has turned since attachment theory began. A third reason for Phil's claim is its breadth of applications to lots and lots of areas 
related, relating to the well-being of young children, ranging from early childhood mental health and clinical intervention, law and public policy, child protection and child welfare, child care policy, and a range of other areas have been influenced by attachment theory and research in ways that I think most of us would agree have been beneficial. And finally, the fourth reason for, Paul, for, 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 for Phil's claim uh, about the influence of attachment theory and research, and I think the most important one, is that the theory continues to develop and evolve in response to new empirical findings and changes in Western society. And I'll be coming back to this point, but I think this is one of the most important markers of a vibrant and generative theory, that it adapts and changes and grows in response to changes in science and changes in conditions, certainly preferable to a theory that is staid, inflexible, and rigid. And I think that is one of the reasons the theory has continued to be influential. Now, granting all of these factors and granting my respect for Phil, I would nevertheless disagree with him. And I would say instead that the impact of attachment theory is not yet ready to be evaluated. And the reason is that I think there are some critical issues that remain to be fully addressed and that continue to be a challenge for attachment researchers. Now, as an illustration of this, two colleagues of mine and I have been laboring this fall to put together uh, the outline for an edited volume that we've been asked by a publisher to put together, provisionally entitled Attachment, the Fundamental Questions, in which we're asking you know, notable developmental scientists from both within and outside attachment theory, including Heidi, to address some of what we think are the critical issues that the theory must contend with in the years forward. So what are the issues that form the framework of this book? Well, here they are. What kinds of relationships can be considered to be attachment relationships, and what makes them so? How should attachment be assessed across the lifespan? What the heck are internal working models derived from attachment relationships? How do they function? What aspects of later behavior can or should early attachment predict or influence? And by the way, what should they not have an influence over? Discriminant validity. What are the connections among atypical attachment patterns, disorders of attachment, and attachment-based interventions is another topic in this book. And then finally, you knew we wouldn't miss this. Culture and attachment. How are attachment processes manifested in different cultures, and how does culture manifest itself in attachment processes? Now, there are several reasons why we're putting this book together. One is simply to show that attachment theory is not a closed theory. Okay? If, if these are fundamental questions that the field still needs to address, it's clear that, that, that attachment theory has not, has not prematurely consolidated answers to these issues. We're still needing to study them. And in fact, um, and in fact we're urging people to study them. And in fact, um, despite a half century of theory and research, um, it is remarkable how much the research findings have forced us to reconsider these and other basic questions. I'll say more about that in just a moment. But another of the purposes of this book is to also present readers with a profile of what the current status of attachment theory and research really are. In a sense, what we're trying to do is to put together a profile of what 21st century attachment research is like, which is different from the attachment research and theory that Bowlby started with and fundamentally important for us to begin our discussions with today. In fact, so fundamentally that that's exactly the title of the chapter that I contributed to Heidi and Kim's book, 21st Century Attachment Theory. Because I think it's extremely important, especially when we talk about culture and attachment, that we look at attachment theory and research in its current form. As I mentioned, the theory has evolved over time, and that means that it continues to present challenges to atta that, that attachment theory is having to respond to and adapt to, and raising new questions that future research and theory need to address. So what do I have in mind by these kinds of challenges? Well, I outlined the book, but let me now sharpen some issues with respect to questions of, of attachment and the fundamental questions relating to what we think attachment is and does. And it, I want to do so by highlighting the ways in which I think 21st century attachment theory has moved beyond Bowlby's theory. Um, and, 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 that's, it, and it's that 21st century version that we need to focus on. Four examples of this for you, and then I'll quit. First, attachment researchers now recognize that infants and young children typically develop attachment relationships to multiple partners. 
including fathers as well as mothers, perhaps members of the extended family who have a regular caregiving role, and perhaps also child care providers. Multiple attachments are the norm, and this is in contrast to Bowlby's focus on mother-child attachment, which was at that time consistent with the time and culture in which he lived. But recognizing that multiple attachments exist returns us to the question that we're using in our book. What kinds of relationships can be considered to be attachment relationships? What qualifies as an attachment for a young child? And it is here, I think, that dialogue with culturally minded researchers can be especially helpful. Recognizing that children are growing up in cultural settings in which a whole variety of people might possibly be attachment figures. And this further, I think, expands our thinking about the breadth of attachment phenomena. Now, what does it take to gather that kind of evidence? I think from an attachment point of view, uh, we begin with asking how many people are caring for the child? What is the range of the care providing network that a child is, 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 being experience, is experiencing, is being exposed to? But I think that we also have to focus not just on who's providing care, but what is their meaning to the child? And from that point of view, we've got to look at not just who's doing it, but how is the child responding to those partners? And my view is that when we look at the evidence, what we find, as we might expect, is that whereas children are, in many different cultural settings, are surrounded by a variety of caregivers, not all those care providers are attachment figures, just as we would expect. In fact, in one study conducted with the Aka in the Congo rainforest, Congo Basin rainforest by Megan and Hawks, um, the, 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 um, their measurement of attachment figures was based not only on who provided care for the child, but mainly to whom the child directed attachment behaviors, such as proximity and contact seeking, affectional initiatives, and directional crying when distressed. So the first question, multiple attachments, but who constitutes an attachment figure? Second question, how should we think about the meaning of individual differences in attachment? How do we characterize those differences? Um, well, Bowlby's emphasis on security versus insecurity resonated, of course, with his perception of the needs of young children, especially in the post-war, that had an influence, especially in the context of the post-war cultural context in which he wrote. And the idea of security has continued to resonate with, with readers um, in the Western world ever since that time. Furthermore, Bowlby situated security um, within an early childhood mental health context. He argued that developing a secure attachment leads the way toward more healthy emotional development than an insecure attachment because, and this is important, because he believed it was evolutionary adap evolutionarily adaptive. This is what our species is oriented toward, he said, that security norm is species typical. Deviations from that are species atypical and abnormal. But attachment theory has evolved since this formulation. For one thing, attachment researchers have been influenced by the thinking current developments in evolutionary biology to realize that rather than one pattern of attachment being typical for the human species and other patterns being abnormal, it is more likely that each attachment pattern, secure and insecure, reflects the child's psychological adaptation to the particular context in which the child is being cared for. And each may therefore be considered adaptive for the specific context in which the child is living. So even the avoidant pattern that Professor White very kindly outlined for us can be considered biologically adaptive, even adaptive in a mental health context, because it is adapting to a caregiver who is reliably unresponsive, so the research shows. And so freeing yourself from an emotional bond to that caregiver in order possibly to go to somebody else who might provide what you need might be the very adaptive thing to do, at least from the point of view of helping to ensure a child's survival. And I think attachment theory is settled on that idea. But what both Bowlby's view and current attachment theory does emphasize, and this is important from a cultural point of view as well, is that each culture, regardless of context and regardless of values, does have to solve a fundamental problem. And that is, how are they going to ensure that infants survive to reproductive age in order to create further children? And um, that challenge, which each culture has to grapple with, um, it's likely solved in somewhat different ways 
based on the conditions and the values of that particular culture. I think that's one of the ways in which culturally minded researchers can contribute substantially to this question of how do we think about variations in the security of attachment. If it's not a matter of security, if parent nurturance is not fundamental, then what is? What is the alternative view? Now, a third question that is kind of governing our understanding of how attachment theory has evolved over the years relates to the kinds of influences that lead to these differences in attachment. Bowlby argued that, like Ainsworth, argued that parental sensitivity, which is a sensitivity hypothesis that was presented earlier, sensitivity is the important predictor. Parents who are sensitive re re reliably um, will, will have infants who are securely attached because of the trust and confidence that that, is, that that is thought to generate in the child. But this is where, interestingly enough, attachment researchers and theories had to recognize that the empirical evidence on this question is not fully supportive of this view. And some of you are aware of this, of course. A meta-analysis of a large number of studies conducted in the Western world, of studies, of studies conducted with samples in the Western world on the association of sensitivity, parental sensitivity, the security of attachment, concluded, quote, sensitivity is an important but not exclusive condition of attachment. And consequently, researchers for several years, for a number of years, have had to look beyond sensitivity alone in understanding other predictors of the security of attachment. This is required looking, for example, at the quality of the marital relationship between, between parents or other care providers in the home as an influence on the child's experience of security. It is required looking at the stress of the home environment. And both of those factors have been shown to affect the security of attachment. And it may also re be involve reconsidering more deeply how do multiple attachments affect a child? How do uh, attachments to one care provider affect the child's attachments to the other care provider? And all those are working hypotheses within attachment theory to try to explain some of that transmission gap that Professor White alluded to earlier. Taken together, therefore, attachment researchers are still working on the question of what accounts for individual differences in attachment. And on this score, culturally minded studies can be really, really helpful by focusing us on the conditions of care and their effects upon children in the context in which those occur. If parental nurturance is not central, to the quality or the depth of the bonds between children and, and their care, care providers, then what is? And finally, to turn to the last question about how attachment theory and research have evolved, I think attachment theory has also changed with, respecting to with respect to understanding what are the predictable outcomes of individual differences in these relationships. And as Professor White pointed out, that really is, in some respects, the big question. That, um, that attachment research is continuing to grapple with. Um, this is the competence hypothesis, in other words, that he earlier profiled. Bowlby's original theory focused on social and emotional outcomes, consistent with the general early mental health orientation of his theory. That made a lot of sense. That early security of attachment is going to influence the quality of children's relationships and relatedness to other people and sense of self. The problem is that Despite the narrow focus of Bowlby's theory, research since that time has absolutely exploded this formulation. As studies have identified a dauntingly broad range of correlates of early attachment security identified in a child's later behavior. I mean, the list includes not just social and emotional functioning, but cognitive and language development, math achievement. There's some studies that indicate even political ideology is predicted by security of attachment. And I'll leave it to you to guess which are the political affiliations later yielded by early insecure attachments. I'll let you think about that. Now, I've been a reliable reviewer of that research for a number of years. And, um, and I am amazed at the numbers of things that's, that researchers have found to be associated with security of attachment. In fact, this led, in their own review, a couple of prominent researchers of this research to ponder, is there anything to which attachment security is not related? And for me, this means that I think researchers need to do a better job of refining their hypotheses and designing their studies. It's no longer adequate in attachment research to simply do um, pre-post studies in which you're antecedent measure is the security of attachment, then later on you do a follow-up measure of some outcome, and you simply look at the relationship between the two and publish your article. 
Because oftentimes those, those associations may do, be due, as you all have been trained to know, by unmetric third variables that are mediating that association. It's not that attachment security predicts math achievement. It's that attachment security may be related to the quality of parent-child relationships that has parents perhaps helping children with their homework at school. And now you've got math achievement. Those are not the kinds of ways that a lot of the attachment research has been designed in the past, but it's increasingly being so. The bottom line here is that attachment research and theory does not embrace a narrow view of what early attachment should lead to in a child's development. In fact, this is a very open question now, as we're trying to understand what are the direct, but also what are the mediating and moderated associations of early security with later developmental outcomes. I've heard the bell, so I will wrap up quickly. <laughs> so the bottom line is that attachment theory indeed is an evolving theory, and cultural studies can have a lot to contribute as it continues this evolution. But my final point is this. It's really important for these studies from on attachment and culture to be relevant to the central claims of attachment research. When I was writing the chapter on 21st century attachment theory for the, for the volume that Heidi and Kim had put together on culture and attachment, I, I noticed that while culturally oriented researchers ask for greater culturally informed attachment research, attachment researchers sometimes wonder where they can find greater attachment informed cultural studies. And by that I mean that when they survey the research literature on culture and attachment, attachment researchers often find few studies that address the central claims of attachment theory in an informative way. I mentioned earlier, for example, that looking at the sheer number of caregivers in a child's ecology is not an index of the number of attachment figures there are. You have to look from a child's point of view at how the child is responding to those figures, and few cultural studies do that. In fact, uh, as an interesting reflection on this, um, Alma Gottlieb's 20 th 2004 remarkable volume on the culture of infancy among the Bang of West Africa opens with the question, where have all the babies gone? And in posing this question, Gottlieb reflects on the absence of attention to infancy by contemporary cultural anthropologists. So the bottom line, I think, is that attachment theory has, has work to do, and so also do culturally-minded attachment researchers. Attachment theory has a lot of work to do in addressing some of these fundamental questions and doing so in a way that benefits from the insights offered by our culturally-minded colleagues. At the same time, I think that culturally-minded researchers um, have work to do as well in thinking about how to design studies in ways that inform the central tenets of attachment theory and, 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 and in the end, help to generate provocative new hypotheses to do what we always have hypotheses doing in our field, namely having us go out into the field and discovering further truth. Thank you again so much for being here. waiting for the, yeah. Meanwhile, I can also uh, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Daniel, to this uh, exciting occasion. And uh, I'm very much attached since many years to this center already. And uh, I'm also happy, Ross, that you are here because you are one of the few attachment researchers who is uh, talking to people who are not attachment researchers. And actually, uh, Daniel, thank you also for uh, assigning me this uh, new status, but attachment researchers think that I'm not doing attachment research. And uh, I am uh, excuse myself right from the beginning because I'm throwing some stones now in the, in the clear water that we have so far. And, uh, want to make uh, a couple of, uh, of points in that respect. Certainly, attachment theory was a landmark. It was a major shift in uh, perspective, and it was a paradigm uh, when it was uh, first uh, formulated. And uh, it was a very significant contribution. But um, it has uh, certainly been developed within a particular historical context 
And uh, we all agree that uh, time has changed and societies have changed and science <laughs> has changed. And uh, nevertheless, attachment theory certainly will keep its uh, historical importance and will be part of any textbook uh, of developmental psychology uh, for the years to come. Nevertheless, I have two major concerns uh, regarding attachment theory. And one is that uh, the basic assumptions of attachment theory are scientifically fuzzy and or wrong. And the second one is that attachment theory poses tremendous ethical challenges. And um, I would like to um, uh, explain both uh, topics uh, with a couple of examples. And uh, starting with the scientific value first, uh, uh, and some of these aspects Ross has already mentioned, and we have some very similar <laughs> points to make. Um, the definition of attachment uh, is unclear. Um, the evolutionary uh, basis is incorrectly uh, treated, and I have uh, put this in bold letters, the cultural blindness. This is an overarching issue also for the other topics. So, what is an emotional bond? We have heard the affectional tie and emotional bond. Obviously, it's not a man's tie, but we can find those kind of illustrations where you see the shadows of a mother and a baby. I have asked kindergarten teachers uh, to draw attachment as an emotional bond, and these are just three examples. So, as you can see, there are very different representations in the minds of uh, people in the heads of people of what attachment is like. And there are so many open questions. So the range of coverage is attachment with the caregiver, a small child relationship, is it the uh, peer relationship during middle, middle childhood, is it romantic relationship? We can all find these topics uh, as attachment research. Who qualifies as an attachment figure? Uh, what is the hierarchy of relationship, even if uh, multiple caregivers are recognized, uh, meanwhile, by many attachment researchers? Um, there is always a hierarchy implied that one person is the most important. And um, I, I think the most basic point here is also, is attachment a relation, uh, relationship quality, or is it a trait? Certainly, it is a relationship quality, because it <laughs> describes the relationship that uh, two persons have to each other, um, and, and this has particular implications. And it can change over time, as we know from studies between 12 and 18 months, this relationship quality can change. But it is usually treated as a trait, as a characteristic of a person. We say a child is securely attached meaning the child has a secure relationship with one caregiver, but maybe a different relationship with a different caregiver. And that poses uh, lots of problems uh, for many of these uh, hypotheses that you uh, mentioned initially. Um, attachment is defined as an emotional bond represented in an internal working model. What is an internal working model? Ross has uh, already uh, uh, made this point, and I'm referring to uh, his writing here. Is it a psychoanalytic concept of a dynamic unconscious? Is it a cognitive perceptual schema? Is it an emotion bias and pre-attentive uh, processing, et cetera, et cetera? And of course, there are many more open questions. So how are different attachment qualities negotiated in the internal working model? How does this representation that has these uh, consequences for uh, future development. Um, uh, how, how is this related to presumably different attachment qualities that a child has to different caregivers? And what is uh, the basis uh, for predictions? And this relates to the competence hypothesis. Uh, we have already heard about that too. Uh, if it is a relational quality, uh, and here it is again treated as, uh, as a trait, and um, the uh, predictive power, the competence hypothesis, uh, is, is one of the fuzziest uh, uh, concepts, I think, and uh, Elizabeth Mines, or Means, I don't know how exactly to pronounce her name in English, attachment researcher, basically, she says that this is 
uh, the competence hypothesis is uh, the overrated aspect of attachment theory. She has written a marvelous essay about this. So just to uh, highlight these questions, moving to the next one, evolutionary theories are grossly misconceived and already Bowlby would have had the chance to read about evolutionary theory. Hamilton's uh, book was out, Trevor's book came out during the 17th, Wilson's uh, book came out during the 17th, so there, there was plenty of, of access to uh, evolutionary uh, theory um, from, from many different uh, authors, but um, uh, it, it's a very restricted understanding and, and a very faulty understanding. Context, for instance, is not taken seriously, which is a, a basic requirement from an evolutionary perspective. Context basically is the sensitivity of the caregiver, but not the living circumstances of the caregiver and the family. Um, the uh, environment of evolutionary adaptedness where the origins of attachment are located uh, is a highly controversial concept in evolutionary um, biology because uh, there is not just one cradle of humankind uh, being discussed. Evolution also does not have a goal. Well-being is not an evolutionary category. Secure attachment is not something that evolution is uh, selecting for. Adaptation does not imply universality. There are many examples that uh, could highlight this. Maybe we can come back in the discussion to this. And also the the rhesus monkey is not the model for human social behavior as has been treated by Bowlby. And Stephen Sumi uh, has once uh, formulated this wonderful sentence, I think, one wonders how Bowlby's attachment theory would have looked like if Hind, an ethologist to whom Bowlby was referring a lot, had been studying capuchin rather than rhesus monkeys. So there is a huge variety of different ways of life, of different and social organization in different uh, non-human primate groups. And several attachment researchers, uh, and, and Ross is, is one of them, um, they uh, attest that uh, attachment theory has messy origins, like this uh, Dutch uh, group is arguing. Uh, and they're saying we fully acknowledge that most of Bowlby's ideas were not well grounded in adequate supporting evidence, were influenced by contemporary ideologies, and that caution is needed in using those that have not seen adequate testing. But these authors, as well as Ross, claim that attachment theory has changed substantially over the last 50 years. Uh, again, uh, these authors uh, with the references. Um, Marga Vicedo, a colleague, a science historian who is also uh, fighting her battles with attachment theory, is uh, replying to um, a uh, critique of uh, this Dutch group to one of her papers. Uh, saying, my critics uh, accuse me of conflating Bowlby's ideas with more recent and current attachment theory and research. Perhaps they are right, perhaps they are not. To decide, I have two simple questions for them. Which fundamental flaws in the empirical, conceptual, and theoretical work found in Bowlby and Ainsworth have attachment scholars explicitly recognized and decided to leave behind? And what is attachment theory today? And I, I think Ross agrees, because you said uh, also uh, several times that it is difficult to indicate definitely what attachment theory uh, currently claims. On the other hand, there are attachment researchers who have a different view. For instance, Jude Cassidy, one of the editors of this influential handbook of attachment, she says, Bowlby and Ainsworth's original ideas have held up well. Nothing has emerged from the thousands of studies produced over the last 40 years has led to a serious challenge of the core theory of the bowlby Ainsworth uh, formulation. Um, and the cultural blindness. 
the universality claim of attachment uh, theory rests on implicit assumptions representing Western middle class families. And I want to, um, to, to make a couple of, of points here. Uh, first is the definition of a family. It's the uh, nuclear two-generation family um, that certainly is uh, backing up uh, the formulations of attachment theory, but there are quite uh, different conceptions of family, like for instance this uh, Bedouin family here, uh, where um, uh, the fathers are not, or, or let's say the, the lives of men and women are very much separated and of course there are obviously some visitors. There are many implicit assumptions. So, are attachment figures. Okay. So for us, it's uh, quite um, normal that uh, adults are caring for young babies, and mainly it's the mother, maybe the father sometimes also. Um, but in many other cultural environments, it's uh, sibling caregiving. And sibling means category of children. It's not necessarily biological siblings, like in this uh, example of uh, um, Northwest Cameroonian village. Um, interactions are exclusively dyadic and dialogic is uh, another uh, of these uh, implicit assumptions where uh, the the face-to-face -face, uh, arrangement in the uh, Western um, middle class um, setup is the norm, but um, interactions are uh, varied in, in different contexts, like again in this uh, Cameroonian compound, as you can see, there is not much face-to-face -face contact, there is a lot of body contact, uh, and there, there is a lot of, uh, of uh, ongoing interactions uh, among many several people. Um, so the total of individual dyadic encounters is not the same thing than the experience of multiple polyadic social encounters. And uh, therefore, uh, also, uh, the, uh, the, the definition of uh, social experiences are qualitatively different on uh, that sense. The, the sensitivity assumption is in um, attachment theory, it's following the infant's lead with affect mirroring, with responsiveness, verbalization, mentalization, and, and praise. But in many other uh, communities, it's uh, following a communal uh, script with affective neutrality, modesty, with a lot of structuring, with a lot of action-related uh, behaviors and uh, also a lot of criticism. So bad child, bad child is uh, uh, something that we can hear uh, often in, in the Cameroonian and in, in other villages. And um, uh, this uh, particular uh, appreciation of the unu uniqueness, a star, uh, valuable uh, denominators that a group of uh, Euro-American parents has assigned uh, to their children. So it's a complete different attitude. What is good for a child? And all these uh, caregivers want the best for uh, their child. The centrality of emotions. Uh, is it the mental state or a physical care? We have these... Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Situations where a stranger is approach a one-year-old child, and as you can see, this is a German uh, one-year-old is completely confused by the intrusion of the, the strange adult. And when he realizes what is uh, what is happening, he he is uh, starting crying and is being returned uh, contrary to the strange situation procedure that we do not do. Completely different in a Cameroonian uh, village where also a stranger approaches uh, a one-year-old child who is, uh, happens to be breastfeeding.
Hello, Junya. 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 I don't know. This hand clapping is a typical way of approaching uh, a child in this uh, Cameroonian uh, villages. And as you can see, uh, the, the child is even uh, stretching her arms. And don't say he's looking depressed. He looks, uh, according to the... Um, uh, yeah, to the uh, cultural standards, sh not showing emotions. Um, I'm uh, already short of time, unfortunately, and uh, so I have to uh, only point to uh, this conclusion in the uh, famous uh, Handbook of Attachment. Until further notice, attachment theory may therefore claim cross-cultural validity after these authors have, uh, um, uh, I mean, they have cited many, many of this kind of studies with completely different arrangements. So there, there are um, three conclusions possible. Bowlby and Ainsworth's original ideas have held up well. Attachment theory is a broad, comprehensive theoretical framework and has changed substantially over the last 50 years, but um, many people from the cultural <coughs> camp, like me, think that attachment theory has not changed its basic tenets and has not corrected faulty assumptions. Um, attachment theory poses uh, tremendous ethical challenges and I want to briefly um, uh, touch three topics, diagnostics and intervention, mm -hmm. child welfare and education. Um, evaluation, uh, uh, diagnostic and intervention, um, meaning evaluating one system with the standards of another. And I wanted uh, to um, explain uh, a little bit in more detail uh, at the children's drawings, which is uh, one uh, way of uh, to, to assess uh, attachment security. And uh, the indicators of, of secure attachment is what we typically find in drawings of uh, Western middle class children like this one, separate individualized uh, people, arms up, interestingly, standing on a baseline, etc. But if we have uh, drawings from Cameroonian and so children, they look pretty different. And if we analyze them according to the uh, indicators of uh, insecure attachment, we find everything uh, here that uh, is indicating uh, insecure, uh, insecure attachment. So can that be that all the Cameroonian children are insecurely attached and all the majority of the German children, for instance, in that case, were uh, securely attached. Uh, there are uh, uh, intervention programs like uh, responsive uh, feeding, where, uh, which is promoted by the World Health Organization, by UNICEF and by uh, other uh, institutions, uh, which is based in uh, this Western way of um, attachment style um, reality, which is not the reality of the people uh, there. And uh, it is uh, feeding and, and breastfeeding is a co-occurring activity, which is never done in, in uh, that matter. And uh, uh, teaching the people to behave in this way has, I mean, uh, ethical, but also lots of other problems. I wanted to uh, talk about the case of the Bhattacharya uh, family um, who lost their children in Norway. I unfortunately ran out of time, but uh, all the child, Norwegian Child Welfare Institute uh, took the children away from the family based on attachment-like uh, evaluations of uh, mother-child interactions, basically like uh, no face-to-face -face contact, no eye contact, etc. And uh, it, it took the family more than 10 years 
uh, to get the children back. And this is just one case that has become very prominent, but there are very many cases that you can find in this uh, web pages. And also um, in the educational field, we have uh, in German the saying, keine Bildung ohne Bindung, meaning no uh, education without attachment. And we have these um, attachment based uh, uh, adult child uh, uh, centrality in the daycare setting. This is almost 50% uh, of the time that an average daycare teacher spends during a usual day uh, uh, with one child. So uh, there is not much going on among children, although this is the major motivation for most families to get their children. Or the transition to daycare, the um, Berlin model, uh, it, it's more, it, it's a, a kind of a program where uh, up to several weeks uh, the main caregiver, mainly the mother, is spending with the child in the institution and an adult caregiver. And this is uh, um, considered to represent a smooth uh, transition. Actually, it resembles very much the strange situation procedure where a child is uh, um, spending time uh, with uh, unfamiliar people because in many cultural contexts uh, children are not used to spend time with adults as mother and father but uh, with other children. So um, but what could be the future directions? There is consensus that communication between cultural, cross-cultural and attachment researchers is needed and uh, we kind of try to keep this dialogue, but there are basic differences among uh, us. Uh, and, and one, you, you also were uh, referring to this example, without that we have talked about <laughs> this before. Uh, so uh, Ross has made this difference between uh, attachment-informed cross-cultural research and cross-cultural attachment research. So, so what is actually uh, the difference uh, between uh, these two formulations? I mean, um, attachment-informed uh, research means using the uh, attachment procedures, the assessment procedures which all have very many problems uh, of reliability, of validity, uh, and so on. And uh, yeah, I ran out of time. I could uh, talk more about this uh, topic. Unfortunately, uh, you have already referred to this volume where Ross has uh, a chapter and where many other people um, voice uh, um, their concerns or their uh, evaluations of uh, attachment uh, theory. Thank you very much. Okay, okay, okay. I think I'll be needing a microphone um, to go over there. But um, thank you very much for two, I think, very stimulating talks. Um, although you've already stressed the overlap between your <laughs> views, I, um, I very much hope that um, we can now maybe also try to sharpen the differences and, and, and the uh, agreement between the two of you. Um, so we'll step over here and um, yeah, I'll be using this. Does this work? Yeah. Wow. So, um, to, uh, perhaps try to also get a smooth transition into this, um, into this uh, debate and dialogue. I think um, you were short of time, but I, th I think 
the question for me, um, which you bring up with this, this, this opposition between um, cross-cultural attachment research versus attachment research um, from a cross-cultural perspective, if I'm getting it right, I wonder um, what would uh, what would the the factors be? I mean, how would you actually um, want that good, want to go about that? Would would it involve um, beginning with um, a completely new method, um, a completely entirely new theory, as it were, um, starting like Mary Ainsworth did? Possibly um, just by observing, and then and then going from there, and and observing within the culture. So I, I don't want to answer your question. So this is just my. Okay. Now, I th I think basically we have a lot of agreement. We only come to completely different uh, conclusions. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, we really have a, a common and all the points that you are also raising in your writing about attachment theory are. are uh, I can agree 100%, only I, I don't think that actually um, attachment theory really has changed and uh, the, 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 the theory still is applied in its basic uh, formulations and, and many of the attachment researchers also claim that the theory has held up well and that um, it's not necessary uh, to change it and, and all the um, interesting aspects also of the ad adaptedness or adaptivity of, of insecure attachment doesn't find its way actually neither in the theory nor uh, in the practical application and um, the, the real problem that I have is that attachment theory uh, in the applied field is really causing, uh, to say it in a mild form, a lot of distress because uh, children are evaluated according to attachment theory. There, there are even popular books for mothers and, uh, and everybody uh, where you can easily recognize whether your child is uh, insecurely attached or securely attached and with easy examples. I know you would never uh, subscribe to, to such a view, but um, what I'm missing is uh, that uh, attachment researchers do not form a louder voice in order to, to distancing uh, f from, from all these appearances that we find everywhere. And, and attachment theory is... Um, uh, it, it has been applied meanwhile, or it is being applied pervasively. It, it is intruding every field and uh, um, daycare teachers learn to classify children. It's a relational quality, if at all. Uh, but it's not a personality characteristic of a child. So, and all these things are mixed up, and and I miss that attachment researchers uh, stand up and say, uh, uh, "You are uh, handling our theory wrongly," and, and th th some clarification is needed. So. <laughs> You people out there, you're handling our theory wrong and you really should stop. And you want one really good example of that? Um, I don't know, has, has attachment parenting made its way out here? Oh, yes. Of course. Okay, okay. now if you, if you talk with attachment researchers uh, or anybody who knows attachment theory, um, you will find an involuntary wincing, uh, sometimes followed by groaning every time somebody brings up attachment parenting, because attachment parenting has nothing to do with attachment theory. In fact, many of its propositions are just inimical to attachment, parent, uh, to attachment theory. Um, and although I did not succeed in getting my colleagues to write an article uh, in, the volu in the journal Attachment and Human Development to state that clearly, um, I, th I think that's, that's, that's a pretty widespread view. I mean, obviously, you don't take a theory that has been framed along sort of Western culture, Western values, so I think we have to acknowledge that attachment theory is, and, and then apply it K 
casually and haphazardly to families who are raising their children with different cultural values. And, and those are many of the examples you were talking about. But in this respect, attachment theory is not alone. I mean, child welfare workers often apply misappropriate theories to culturally different families that they're working with. That's probably less the fault of attachment theory and more the fault of the child welfare worker who's, who's making those applications. Um, you know, likewise, I think that there is a difference between, between uh, what I think we're looking for, that is culturally informed attachment research. I mean, I tried to identify lots of the different ways in which cultural studies could inform these open questions in attachment research. And, and attachment informed cultural studies, which is what I don't find. And that you, the reason I use the example of the Aka um, in, the, in the Congo Basin is that it was one of the few examples I was able to find where researchers took where, you, where it started where um, cultural researchers usually stop, which is to document the number of care providers in a child's ecology, um, but, but didn't settle for that because being attachment informed, they said, no, we actually need to ask what is the meaning of those different caregivers to the child? And that's why they looked at the child's responses to each one of those to, dis to, de to determine who were attachment figures. One can criticize the method, but it wasn't bad. And of course, what they found was that wide network of care providers, much smaller network of attachment figures. Yeah. Uh, and that would be an example of attachment-informed cultural research for two reasons. One is that it does what attachment theory claims to be able to do, which is to try to look at the world from the child's point of view, um, rather than simply mapping the ecology. And the second thing it does, interestingly enough, is it uses measures that are well suited to the context. Now, I had thought, and I'm sure we would have given more time, that you would have raised the issues, as I think would be justified, of the numbers of studies that are in which you use basic attachment measures developed in Western contexts and transpose them to a non-Western mm -hmm. context and, and expect that it's going to tell you the same thing without having done even the most basic validational stuff. Um, and that's, that's not worthwhile. Um, but I do think that one of the things I liked about this study is it used a set of measures of child behavior that I'd be hard pressed to say um, are, are simply reflections of Western values. I mean, babies who, 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 um, who preferentially seek to be close to somebody, babies who um, want to be picked up when they're distressed or cry in a directional manner or show other signs of affectional behavior toward a parent. Those would be what I would consider to be attachment behaviors and probably not bad measures in the cultural context in which they did, all of the uh, things being equal. Um, so I think that's an example of what I would consider to be attachment-informed cultural research. And I don't, I don't think there's a lot of it out there, partly because taking the child's point of view and asking, you know, how does the world look from that point of view, is just not how, um, well, it's why we've got developmental psychologists in the world. Um, so that's, that's a different, not that, they're, not, that, that, not that people should use attachment measures, but that sh people should use the attachment framework, which is to ask, what are the meaning of people to, to children? Yeah, but, but look, for instance, uh, I'm uh, studying uh, children's relationships uh, within their relational network in many different cultures since very many years. And uh, one of my students was in a conference, uh, in, a, in an attachment conference in London, and um, uh, she was referring to some of my work and uh, the attachment researchers who were present there responded immediately, she's not an attachment researcher. So why are people who are studying relationships not attachment researchers, if we are studying significant relationships and relationships that transcend from a situation. And of course, the, the social network is not equivalent with the attachment network of a child, but uh, I think there are so many interesting ethnographic studies who, and also who try to, to understand what how is relationship defined? So I think with, with predefined views, uh, what is a relationship and how does it look like? And, and I mean, uh, emotional expression uh, may be an indicator in some cultures, but not in other cultures. So uh, we have to understand from within how the relational network, I mean, there is no doubt that every uh, child needs significant relationships in order to grow and to thrive and that, um, but, but they are very different and I uh, deeply disagree also with um, 
counting the number of, uh, of uh, dyadic uh, encounters uh, uh, and, and uh, set it equivalent to uh, multi-party uh, interactions. They, they are completely different qualities, completely different dynamics, and maybe also completely uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, different uh, outcomes, and uh, I, I think we, we. I'm. I'm not. Uh, I do not want to erase uh, attachment research from uh, the scientific landscape. But I think we need to start carefully defining about what we are talking. And um, uh, you are one of the few people who are. Um, uh, careful regarding the measures, but usually attachment research is only the application of attachment measures. And in, in the Stringman Forum, you said uh, the strange situation uh, is outdated, not many, uh, so we don't take it serious anymore, but most of the people rely on it still as the uh, golden standard for it. And, and children are evaluated and families are evaluated. I mean, in the daycare centers, I'm working a lot with, uh, with the daycare teachers and in kindergartens, um, uh, the children are uh, classified uh, per impression as securely or insecurely attached and that also means that there is a judgment about the, the mother mainly, not even the father. So th there is a lot going on and I think uh, we as researchers have the, or scientists, also the attachment scientists, have the responsibility also to look into that phase of, of the application. And what is happening in, in uh, child welfare, um, not only in uh, Norway, uh, in many different countries, in Germany and Austria, uh, based in attachment theory, justified with attachment theory, um, that, that's really, uh, it's unethical from my perspective. Well, I, I agree. I, I think that when you are misapplying a theory developed for one particular group and applying it to another group who are going to be different in practices and values, that, that again, that is, is unethical. Again, I think the pro pro it's not a problem of attachment theory, it's a problem of its misapplication. And it's very hard to it's very hard to have a theory that is so well known, especially that is so well known by so many people in a casual fashion, to avoid its misapplication. So you're right. I mean, there are teachers who try to, you know, by the, the basis of their experience with a child in a classroom, decide that child is securely attached, this child is insecurely attached, and it's idiotic. Um, but it's hard. I mean, it's it's the same way in which in the heyday of Piaget's theory. Um, people were um, coming up with educational curricula that were foolish based on a misrepresentation of his stages. I think that's unavoidable. You're right, researchers should do a good job of pointing out when those misapplications occur. But the problem is that you can either be a researcher or a police officer. Um, it's hard to do both. The, the, I think the challenge is also um, how to develop um, how to develop a greater awareness of cultural diversity in attachment processes that does not simply reject formulations but comes up with new ones. So I remember our talking about this um, at, 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 in, in, in Frankfurt. Um, you know, it's, it's not enough to say that, that, um, that, that sensitivity is not universal. Um, that's not a really generative hypothesis because as soon as you've got one culture where you believe that kids are raised fine without sensitivity, you know, you've, you've discounted. What we really need is a new hypothesis. Either sensitivity is not important at all, and this is what's important, or here are the conditions in which sensitivity is important and the conditions in which kids do just fine without it, or some other formulation that, that motivates us to go out in the field and test us. I don't find that coming from the culturally minded um, researchers. Likewise, the hypothesis that cultures vary is not a hypothesis at all. It's a truism. And so how do we go beyond um, what, what I sometimes think, and, and I think this is why you get the reaction you do from attachment theory, which, which I think is more of a rejectionist point of view, holding attachment theory responsible for a lot of the ills of Western child rearing practices. And Lord knows there are lots of ills. Um, and then using uh, single case cultural anecdotes to argue that universality doesn't exist. Um, this is what, by the way, I refer to in the paper, and, and you're familiar with this, is the anthropological veto. 
The idea is that if you've got a disconfirming case, that means any claims of universality can be, can be you know, eliminated, you can't consider it. So, so in a lot of our, my conversations or our conversations in, in Frankfurt, you know, uh, somebody, uh, typically a few of us who, the f few of us who were uh, uh, attachment um, in our background would, would raise a hypothesis that, that might apply to all cultures. And somebody else would say, well, based on my ethnography or the ethnography I read from, so that doesn't apply, so we dismiss it. Well, well, we'll think about it. I mean, this is a silly example, but it's the best I could come up with with jet lag today. You're walking down the street of Leipzig and you see a man with one leg. So now you claim humans don't have two legs. You know, that, that, that two legs is not a universal human quality. Of course you don't. What you end up doing is asking, well, I see so many people with two legs, what can help me understand this exception? And in doing so, we learn a lot more about, in this silly example, leggedness or why exceptions might exist, and sometimes exceptions that might prove the rule, than we do by simply look, using the disconfirming case to, to argue against any possibility that something can be universal. I think what attachment theorists believe is that, is that culturally minded, and minded researchers do not want to move beyond one ethnography after one ethnography after one ethnography. Finding generalizable conclusions is very hard. Finding claims that, it, that culturally minded researchers will apply across cultures um, is hard to do. And, and I think it, it leads to the conclusion that, um, that it's really hard to build something that is hypothesis building and hypothesis testing from this approach. And I would love to see, to see that happen because that's when I think you begin building data and building ideas that, that really present the kind of challenge to the formulation of attachment ideas. I mean, right now, I'll, I'll, one more sentence, I'll, I'll finish this up because I want to hear your response. Right now, one of the reasons attachment theory is so sloppy, and I've been saying this for 40 years, is that there's no viable alternative to challenge it. So provide it. Uh, I, I do not agree. There, there are uh, many, many conceptions. Um, um, bringing relationships into a conceptual framework and into a theoretical framework. And, uh, uh, but, but attachment researchers usually uh, do not uh, confirm or do not accept this as attachment. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that is one of the problems. That you, you are only uh, taken serious by attachment research and you are certainly not a typical uh, representative uh, of the hardcore attachment researchers. And you and I have both been rejected by them. <laughs> I, I know, I know. You have a particular history <laughs> with it. And, uh, but, but it's, uh, you, you have to use the methods. If you don't use the methods, the strange situation, the QSOR technique, which is equally uh, having Western biases in, in the items, um, if, if you don't uh, accept the coding system, like in this children's drawings, things, or, or other uh, uh, measures, um, then you're do not, not doing attachment research. And, and it's so fixed. I mean, it's so, uh, th there is so much prejudice. And, and there is also a closeness in, dis in discussion. Uh, when we were planning, Kim and I were planning this uh, Strongman Forum with Julia, um, uh, we wanted to have a couple of more attachment researchers, also hardcore attachment researchers, and they didn't come. They rejected it, and uh, uh, I don't want to drop names here, but we were so inviting... This is the Potsdam group is leaving, so yeah. thank you very much for coming. Sorry for interrupting, but it, I was... What we're trying to say is it wasn't anything we said. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Exit. Yeah, uh, I mean, there it's very hard to have an open communication because if you don't use the terminology, if you talk about relationship development, you are not considered uh, to uh, be taken seriously, and and it's a closed community, and and that is a problem. I I think that they are not. Uh, this is why I appreciate your coming here uh, so much. There are not many people who go and and. Uh, are uh, exposing 
themselves to uh, discussions or presenting their views and, and explaining why the, the, you have to use the terminology, you have to use the methodology, and you have to um, discard uh, what, what's not consistent uh, with the theory. One of my PhD students, she does a, um, an analysis of all the studies using the strange situation, and. Um, now she found many more uh, studies than being usually discussed in this uh, over uh, views uh, and, and the summary discussion. So uh, when the results are not the way, and I mean we had this example in Germany with the Bielefeld and the Regensburg and after the Regensburg uh, kids uh, showed uh, the expected behavior, the world were again, was again uh, in order and, and the uh, and, and there were all kinds of ex post facto explanations being sought why the Bielefeld kids behave differently instead of asking, so what's their attachment? What's their relationship? So I think that there's not really, it, it's not a, a scientific attitude from, from my perspective. And uh, of course, as I said, that there's a lot of merit and it, it has uh, really changed um, uh, the discussion of children's development uh, and and people have done um, a lot for for uh, reformulating uh, development but uh, so, so many things are excluded so contextualizing and and being open and uh, going into discourse with with uh, people who have different opinions. And it, it's very interesting to, uh, uh, one of my students was in an attachment uh, conference and in London and there, there was a kind of a, a meeting afterwards where people could come and uh, explain how they li liked the conference. And there were many uh, people from non-Western countries sitting there and crying because they just couldn't get along with the way uh, this is normativity that uh, was apparent, obviously. And, and th these are also part of the, the ethical concerns and, and the large field of application, whether it is in custody decisions, um, be it in, I mean, in the kindergarten setting. I, I um, know of uh, several German kindergartens where children are not admitted uh, when the parents do not, or the family does not agree to this uh, lengthy transition procedure and, and things like that, so. Okay, um, I, th I think I, I want to try to sharpen maybe some differences as well, um, a little bit. I don't yeah, know if it's Daniel possible. did a terrible job of choosing two <laughs> <laughs> um, So one thing I was wondering about in preparing for the discussion is um, whether there are indeed cultures, whether it's not a binary issue here that we're talking about, because I mean, I, I remember reading a lot about subsistence-based cultures that you refer to and that you also showed us videos of. Um, and we also know that there are current developments towards moving into cities and that cities are growing larger and larger. And so I, I've been wondering um, about, about to the extent, is, is there maybe a continuum of how much attachment applies in different contexts? And if yes, and this is really the critical part of the question, what are the factors that we need to that we need to take into account in, in order to see where does it apply and where does it apply less. Okay. I think we have to do careful ethnographic research about the particular context first and, and find out what are the, the living arrangements, what are the values of the people, what are the modalities uh, of children's development and, and then we have to develop the conceptions out of this uh, out, out of that particular context and then in the end we can compare where are similarities and differences and not start with a predefined conception and then see they are all. I, I was in Chile a couple of years ago and there was a Chilean researcher, attachment researcher presenting data and uh, about the security of attachment, what he found out was a majority of city children were securely attached of semi-urban uh, structures. They were mixed and all the Mapuche, which is an indigenous uh, uh, 
one is not uh, supposed to say tribe, but uh, you know what I mean, uh, community, uh, they were all insecurely attached and they took it for granted. So n never asking are there maybe contextual factors or do they have a different understanding? And I, I mean, we all have this um, different uh, reproductive strategies that um, some uh, uh, Belsky and other people have uh, uh, presented. Uh, but, but are we taking these results serious? Why are we wanting every child to be securely attached according to the standards yeah. of secure attachment? Why don't we accept that children are adapted to a particular environment with an insecure attachment? Why are we changing these things? I think th there are so many questions that uh, yeah, See, weren't... Uh, and I think this would be part of the answer to Vicito's question that you put on the overhead. That is the two questions can you identify um, propositions that Bowlby framed that attachment theorists today would explicitly reject? And the idea of one normative pattern that is secure, I think, would be one of those. I could identify several others. And indeed, part of the, the 21st century attachment chapter was written in response to that. I mean, I, again, I, I think, I think, um, I think Heidi's exactly correct about the insularity of a lot of attachment researchers. I actually think over the 40 years I've been part of the theory, or the part of the field, in one way or another, it's actually diminished over time. But I also think it's still very clubby, and, in and that the can applied happen. field. It's it's even growing. Yeah, I, I think there can be truth to that. Let me let me put something else on the table that may be be a useful point because I I think it may be implicit, but let me make it explicit now. That part of what attachment theory is trying to do is a is a is a bridging between between culture. And remember, Ainsworth developed her ideas by studying Ugandan families. It's trying to bridge culture and evolutionary biology. And so what it's trying to do, what it, in its best forms, what it's trying to do is to recognize the importance of context, but to do so also within the view that regardless of culture, across culture, we as a species share some um, biological imperatives. And I tried to articul articulate one of those um, earlier in my talk, which was every culture needs to figure out how to ensure that its infants grow up to reproductive success. If they can't do that, then that's a problem. And it doesn't mean that that culture shouldn't exist or, or whatever, but it, it, does, it does become a problem. And I think that um, in the effort to be culturally minded, um, there are times when applying that evolutionary lens leads us to ask, is this a culture um, that is successful with its children? Now, I cited in the, in the book one, the one example of that that I could find, which was you know, Seymour's drawing on the Dubois ethnography of the Allure, that, that whole. So let me, let me describe this to you. This is a small hold, 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 horticultural community living in an island, Indonesia. And, um, the, the writer who's drawing on this argues that the dispersed caregiving practices that were documented by this ethnographer are consistent with the Allery's values of self-reliance, open expression of anger and hostility, low interpersonal trust, and high aggression of this community, understandably so because it was just emerging from a period of continuous warfare. So this was this is all like a, a culture in crisis, and it doesn't have to go far before we can start thinking of contemporary examples. Uh, in our world of cultures that are in crisis because of warfare, because of starvation, because of depredation. But what Seymour goes on to point out is that the attachment patterns derived from these conditions in which infants experience varying degrees of hunger and unpredictable care, the withdrawal of social support with the onset of walking, and adults provoking young children with teasing, threats, ridicule, and intentional scare tactics um, I then go on to say, yields a portrayal of young children whose working models of social relationships were characterized by what Seymour described as fear, anger, and distrust. Um, and then I suggest that these are what Carlson and Harwood, other researchers would call a, quote, disabled caregiving system, unquote. Now, an attachment researcher would not be hesitant to make that judgment based on, um, uh, based on an attachment theorist's understanding of how you grow infants to, to reach reproductive success and to be able to raise their own children successfully. 
I know that you are more hesitant to do that, and it's because of the respect, and not you personally, but, but you know, cultural anthropologists, because of the overarching need to respect the values of the culture from which those practices emerge. And I think that is one difference then, in, in the sense that, that um, I, think it, uh, I think one would look at the, you know, the various groups where a majority of infants have been found to be insecurely attached, and ask what's going on in there, in that context, interpreted within the values of the culture, and assuming we're using appropriate measures, which often isn't the case, that might be helping us understand uh, those patterns of attachment. I need to interrupt you two because we're now at the point where we need to take questions. I'm afraid, I'm afraid, sorry very much, but we really want to um, see if there's some questions from the audience, if that's okay. Or do you want to have... I this? wanted to give Heidi the, the okay. chance, just a short sorry chance to respond. We'll, I'll give you the, the chance to, to respond to that, but we really want to hear the audience uh, as well. I mean, yeah, I agree to some extent, but we have to, we have to follow up what's happening. I mean, uh, re referring to, to a different example, there, there are all these intervention studies and all these NGOs uh, trying to uh, change caregiver child behavior in uh, sub-Saharan African countries or in Southeast Asia uh, in rural environments or um, literacy training and things like that. Uh, taking um, children and adolescents out of their local culture, equipping them with uh, some kind of uh, um, skills that they cannot use in their environment and isolating them from um, their, their social support system. A, a colleague from Cameron once um, uh, told me the, the story that he had really witnessed that a child who had some schooling, a formal schooling, uh, felt uh, uh, superior to the parents and the family and uh, didn't want to live with them anymore in their compound and built his own room in the compound and uh, eventually, of course, uh, could not succeed as an individual with some uh, years of formal schooling. And formal schooling is another example, I mean, that's not an attachment topic, uh, where a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of uh, certainly well-intended efforts are undertaken that uh, go into the completely wrong direction in alienating the children uh, from their families and and uh, eventually lead to dropouts, so they don't have anything to build on. And I think we we cannot stop with the situation. We have to think. Uh, what's going to happen then in, in the next step, so. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, the next step would be taking questions from the floor. And I see a first raise of hands. Do I just pass on the microphone? Yeah, okay, here we go. Thank you both for a really educational conversation and you've left me with so much to think about, but I have a comment and then a question. So my comment is it seems like so much of this conversation, and understandably so, so much of this conversation focuses on the individual differences aspect of attachment theory. And while that's very important, um, perhaps, it seems to me that um, the attachment field has, I think, jumped over the first hurdle empirically of understanding the mechanisms that children attach, which is really kind of an amazing process. It's an amazing learning process, whether you're secure or insecure. And it seems to me that by studying the mechanisms that give rise to that process, it would help us better give meaning to the individual differences that come out of that learning process. So that's my comment. But my question is, um, trying to better understand where your views differ on cross-cultural applications of um, secure versus insecure labels. So the labels secure and insecure seem to have some connotations about them, that secure is good. I mean, it just sounds good, like we all wanna feel secure. But I'm wondering if your thoughts are that 
across different cultural groups, security, secure attachments manifest differently? Or is it that across different cultural groups, you may get more or less secure attachments and that's okay because it's not that secure or insecure is good or bad, it's just it is what it is and that's what the nature of the caregiving relationship looks like. Definitely it uh, looks different. What may look uh, as one uh, way of insecurity uh, in one culture may be an adaptive uh, pattern. Maybe even uh, one should avoid secure and insecure, more adaptive and maybe non-adaptive, or should use another terminology that doesn't have this uh, history of uh, connotations. And I, I think we, uh, particularly in cultures where children are the main caregivers of babies, um, of course children uh, behave uh, very avoidant in front of adults. Uh, and uh, so you, you cannot compare. The, their security network is within their children's groups and that may look completely different. And uh, it may be harsh in one environment. There are many varieties that are not very well studied. There's a lot of uh, cultural variability. There is not one alternative pattern to the Western one. We know very little. We know uh, about some rural uh, farmers and about some uh, herders, uh, pastoralists, but uh, uh, we don't have a comprehensive knowledge, but we should take all this as hypothesis and, and study from within. What does it mean for this child to feel safe? I, d I think feeling safe and secure is, is certainly a value that uh, applies to everybody. Everybody wants to feel safe and secure, but it may look very different in, in different environments and therefore uh, I would not uh, label these uh, things equally. So I think, yeah, I, I agree with how you're saying. I, I, think that, um, I think that there are two questions here. Um, one is, is security manifested in different ways? And I think the question is undoubtedly so. I mean, just consider um, a child who's being carried on the sling most of the time as the mother is engaged in agrarian pursuits. And so the child is um, breastfed on demand, uh, the child um, is in continuous co physical contact. So that when we think of Western families and the manifestation of sensitivity being prompt responsiveness to cries, well, this is a child who doesn't have to cry very much or at all, who, who's, the mother is responding to postural shifts rather than crying and is able to respond in the context of physical context. So obviously, um, the experience, expression of security, and quite frankly, how, it's, how it is developed is going to vary. So the, that's one question, and I think the answer is yes, it is manifest. And the second question is, how is it measured? So let's assume that security is important. Now, how do we measure this in a culturally sensitive way? Well, putting that child who's been in skin-to-skin -skin contact in the sling, in the strain situation, is absolute insanity. Um, you're going to obviously have an insecurely attached child, just as would be true of any child who's had very little experience of separation. Um, you know, the, the, the strain situation was supposed to be a moderate stressor. And when we get children in that procedure who are, who, who, for whom, you know, that is not a moderate stressor, but uh, an emergency event, a traumatic event, you're not going to assess attachment, you're going to assess something else. And so this is where knowing the context helps us develop also measures. And, and I think attachment researchers have been very slow to do that. By the way, the reason the strain situation tends to be the gold standard is that it is. Um, I, I defy you to find a measure that has, is, that has been as successful in predicting so many things about a child's development, uh, at least in the Western context in which it's been used, as a strain situation is. So there has resulted a perhaps understandable, but nevertheless um, somewhat foolish, tendency to try to use a strain situation as much as possible, because at least we know it's been validated, at least in certain contexts. And given the poor validation record of most of our measures, um, that's, that's not surprising, but it's also not excusable when it's used in context to which it's, it's inappropriate. 
Great question. Yeah, thank you very much. It was very interesting and I <coughs> want to follow up on your statements that um, attachment figures, what an attachment figure is, needs to be clarified. And, and I'm not sure about this, but I guess uh, Balbi said that an attachment figure is whoever um, is able to calm down the other individual by means of proximity and familiarity. And I want to whether this isn't true for every uh, every culture, right? And whether this is a is a concept which is already clearly defined by Baldi. So I mean, this would would also apply for 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 a village, right? So maybe it's the village who calms down the child. So, but it's the proximity and the familiarity. Uh. I think that there are two dimensions. The, the one is the behavior and the other is the person. And so in, in some cultural environments where many different caretakers are caring for a child and maybe also unfamiliar caretakers come up at some point, it's the behavior that's uh, the important point. Uh, and in other environments like in ours, uh, where uh, relationships are very specific and where children are not used to interact with uh, many people, it must be the particular person. And uh, th there are very many interesting examples also uh, how children claim the right that the particular person is closing the buttons in the morning before going to kindergarten and, and things like that. Nobody else is allowed to do that. That would be unthinkable. Uh, given there were buttons in, in other uh, in environments. But uh, I think uh, it, it's important to, to uh, separate the function and the person. And in environments where um, uh, it, it's just uh, not possible due to the uh, constraints by, by the work and, and the daily efforts that uh, every uh, member of the household has to deliver, um, that the specificity of relationship uh, can prevail or can be adaptive. And uh, li like, for instance, with this um, strange situation um, uh, that we did, be because uh, the strange situation in the uh, attachment, uh, classical attachments, and from my perspective, is an unethical situation, also for our middle class uh, children, because I have seen horrible uh, scenes in, in uh, laboratories with children really collapsing and insecure mothers not interfering, uh, etc. But um, uh, these children can basically be uh, comforted and soothed by everybody, even by a strange person. Uh, so th it's the behavior there that counts. And in other uh, contexts, it, it's very specific. And, and there is a, I, I think we always have to keep in mind that uh, adaptation means um, that different contextual conditions have to be taken into consideration. And there are different strategies. And they also change over time. Nothing is fixed forever, so. And actually, that's one of the reasons why my, own, my only, res the only thing I'd add is that I would never use a single behavior as my index of attachment, even if it's soothing when distressed, because there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of relational function that goes on when babies are distressed. And so I think that one of the, um, uh, one of the things that attachment research has contributed to the field, actually, compared to what existed when I started graduate school, is exactly what Heidi described, which is the idea that you have to look at behaviors in terms of their functions and to understand that behaviors can be at times interchangeable as long as they're accomplishing the same functional goal. So if I spend my time focusing on one behavior, like soothing who can soothe, I might be missing the fact that there are other behaviors that also might be reflecting the same function that I'm not measuring. And that's why I would not do that. Does that make sense? <laughs> but <laughs> could I go to um, to the zoo, for example, and try to or fulfill the function uh, someone else fulfills for the child? So myself as a stranger coming there 
and just as grabbing is, the child and and let's 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 assume I could um, behave in a way like them. Yeah, as as a as a stranger, yes, but not as a white man. <laughs> so <laughs> I mean that that really makes a difference. Children were very much afraid of us seeing us for the first time. So, uh, but this. Uh, a strange and uh, so woman could go and pick them up without any problem and they would follow. So I, I think that that is really, uh, uh, yeah, th they are of course detectors of familiarity. Would you stand up so we can see you? Would you yeah. mind? <laughs> thank, you. Uh, thank you both, especially you, Heidi, because this is mental gold. Okay. And uh, I just want to ask if you found any kind of caring intuition, any kind of basic value in each cultural context you did research on, if there's one thing they all share. One thing that I share, all families want to uh, raise their children to competent adults. I think that, that and, and there are many different ways to achieve that goal and, and um, there is, uh, I, I think there is a lot of care. Children care for the children they are in charge of. Adults care for the children. I mean, th these are very basic concepts, and uh, and and uh, social exchange also is a uh, humans uh, exchange uh, behaviors uh, in many different ways. But uh, of course, they are the basic structures, and of course, uh, children. Uh, whether you use the term attachment or relationship. Children cannot survive without uh, significant relationships, and this may be ten, this may be one, th this may differ uh, across context and uh, across uh, many other circumstances. And th the problem is that I have that we take one model as normative and apply it to very different um, living arrangements. For instance, uh, I am spending a lot of time in Israel and we are uh, studying also uh, many different families there, uh, among others ultra-Orthodox families. And, and there are uh, Israeli colleagues who also did uh, uh, family drawings uh, with ultra-Orthodox children and came to the conclusion that uh, many of them, most of them, are uh, disorganized uh, attached because they have particular uh, drawing features that is in that classification disorganized, uh, representing disorganized attachment. Um, we also uh, did drawings, family drawings with um, ultra-Orthodox family members, uh, but we were uh, assessing every member of the family who was able to draw and to talk to us, and we interviewed them after the drawing. What does the drawing mean, and what did you want to express, and what is your conception of family, and, and uh, did you uh, represent this in your drawing, and we became a complete different picture. There is also a lot of relationship structures within a family where 12 to 15 children are being raised, which is completely different from a family where one to two or even three uh, children are being raised. And all this contextual information must be um, into consideration, although close relationships play a significant role in very many different contexts. Is that Addressing your question, you look so skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously not. Maybe. Uh, it is addressing, and I'm very happy about uh, hearing your thoughts. But um, I was more about: is it like would you say empathy is always playing a role too? It's not only the caretaker; it's also the. Um, the um, way of the relationship. 
because you can have non-empathic uh, relationships. Uh, empathy, how we understand this, is uh, defined from a Western perspective. It's a, it's a um, relationship quality between separated individuals. But where you have a conception of the person as uh, basically interlinked with others, empathy is also being differently expressed or, or doesn't play this role. And, and th there are very specific relationships uh, in the one cultural context, empathy is an important uh, uh, developmental achievement and in, in other uh, cultural contexts it, it doesn't play a role in that way where we try to assess it. There we have to find out first how um, the um, feeling for somebody else or caring for somebody else, how is this expressed? And, and I think that is the basic groundwork to find out what are the equivalences between different psychological constructs with which we are used uh, to work. It it's, uh, may look very different and mean the same or it may uh, can, can take all forms, uh, all, all different forms that we would not uh, even think of that this has uh, similar functions. So it, it's, a, it's a very um, tedious process of observing, of understanding a lot of um, qualitative methodology, of participant observations, of all these things before we come up with fixed uh, uh, observational protocols uh, and standardized situation. I don't know whether you agree or not. Thank you both. I, I suppose this question is maybe uh, more for Dr. Thompson, but you mentioned earlier uh, that you had a hard time uh, convincing, as it were, some of your colleagues to maybe speak out about maybe the misuse of attachment theory. And so I'm maybe curious as to like, why you think that might be. Um, well, I was speaking specifically about trying to get them to speak out about attachment parenting. Um, and, I, and I realized a few moments ago I may have simply offended a few people here who, are, who practice attachment parenting and I offer you my apology. Um, I, I, was saying that, I wasn't saying that it was bad, I was saying that I don't think it has much to do with attachment theory and I think that is true. Um, but nevertheless, um, I think that, that you know, there's an old-fashioned tendency that exists, at least in the American Academy, of academics believing that their job is to do the science and it's for others to do the applications. I think that's changing as the science is increasingly becoming relevant to a whole bunch of uh, issues of practice and public policy and researchers are often the best persons to make sure those applications are right. Nevertheless, I, I think my perception is that most of my colleagues in attachment theory did not want to get their hands uh, messy in confronting attachment parenting, which is a very, very popular movement uh, in some parts of our country. And people don't know the difference between attachment people and attachment parenting. Sadly, sadly that's true. Because I'm, I'm a parent <laughs> and I would really like to know um, where exactly you, you see the differences all. Okay. In writing, we differ more than in talking. I think she's not talking about you and me. I think she, are you talking about attachment and attachment parenting? Okay. So. <laughs> um, there are lots of features of attachment parenting. Um, and it's been a while since I have re-familiarized myself with it. But the idea that um, a parent, usually the mother, um, is committed to um, having her child with her continuously for as long as possible um, is, I think, not an expression of, of what attachment theory is all about. Remember that the whole idea of attachment, at least within some parts of Bowlby's theory, is that attachment is balanced with exploration. 
the idea that, that a secure attachment gives you the freedom to go off where no baby has gone before. Um, with the expectation that if you, um, get, if you encounter things that are too much for you, that person will come and get you. But if your baby is, if, you, if your mother has you with them all the time, there's no exploration. So there's no attachment exploration balance. Furthermore, um, speaking as a father, um, it excludes another parent um, and, and uh, lots of other potential care providers. And since I have, throughout my career, been concerned about the messages men receive that cause them to ignore, neglect, or um, walk away from what could be a very significant and meaningful care caregiving role early in life, there's nothing more meaningful to a man than to be basically told, you have no role here, I am going to, I'm with this, this baby is with me all the time. Or as one mother put it, when we had brought her into the lab, to do a strange situation. And she said, well, that's very interesting, these separation episodes. This will be the first time my child has been separated from me. We're, oh, wait a minute. We're not going to do the strange situation. Because uh, it would have been invalid. But the other thing she said, we asked about um, her husband. She said, um, uh, um, she said, he doesn't play much of a role. In fact, I'm not sure, referring to her little one, that she even knows him. And uh, that was an extreme expression of that. But it was also a sense of the exclusivity, because she spoke that with pride. Um, this baby is so much part of my experience, or, the, or I'm such a big part of the baby's experience, that the father has been marginalized. So those are the two things, and, and I don't think that would be consistent with attachment theory. So I think those are the things that they give attachment researchers pause. But there are some similarities. Well, there are some similarities as well. <laughs> but she didn't ask about the similarities. <laughs> I'd like to start by all of us giving a hand to the wonderful speakers. I think that was a fantastic debate. Ever so, ever so relevant today, so thank you very, very much. Um, and um, thank you very much also for coming. Um, I think I just want to close with one minor, small observation. I think it's, um, it's also coming from the debate that I just observed. And I think the, the question also is, for me at least, um, that I think it's important to, to tread, what I've learned from preparing for the debate is to tread very carefully and to be careful about extending my views however much they feel emotionally founded sometimes. I mean, attachment is a very emotional topic um, to other cultures, as it were. Um, and yet, at the same time, and I know this is not what you're suggesting, I think um, within our culture, we can't adopt an anything goes attitude. And, and to some extent, um, I think that, that attachment for many people, especially people who are maybe only casual um, knowers of the, of the theory, is, is like an anchor, and, and, it, and it feels like, oh, well, now this anchor, we're being deprived of it. What, what can we put there in its place? So that's really the observation, and I'd like to close with that. So thank you very much, and thank you all for coming, and I hope you have a good, um, yeah, travel home. Okay. <laughs>